All right, let's jump into this. Hello, Patrick. Hey, what's up, Jared? Good, good. Today we're going to review uh, chapters four, five, and six, okay? Nice one. So let's jump into it. Uh, chapter four for me, it, it was very dense. Like I had to read a little section of it and then think about it and come mm -hmm. back. It, it took longer than I think chapters one, two, and three was just kind of setting the foundation. This is going into it in a bit more detail and it took me longer. Um, the, it took a while. The concept of getting the, you're putting the thought into formation and the way mm -hmm. I, uh, the way I interpreted what it was trying to tell me was this seems more advanced than what you're reading in the secret. This is why a lot of people mm -hmm. don't like the secret because the secret is I want to visualize a big bag of money coming to my door. And then you just sit in the house and visualize. Whereas the way okay. I interpreted this is if you want to build a big practice, it's saying, yes, you're visualizing the practice and you're setting those forces in motion, but then you actually have to go out and take the action. So yes, you need to visualize, but there's also stuff you need to do as well. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. You can't just, uh, manifest it from the formless. It, it's things are manifested along the already created chains of action so that there's like, um, it is kind of a dense chapter, but it, and this has been argued about for millennia, but basically the idea of consciousness being primordial, like consciousness is a thing that exists in the universe or that it came from random collections of molecules coming together. And so this takes the perspective that uh, the law of mentalism, that everything's mental, that everything comes from consciousness and thought first. And you've got this pure unmanifest potentiality and by holding a thought, a fixed thought in this formless substance, uh, in this uh, thinking stuff, then that's what brings about the material form into creation. And um, so it's about holding this fixed thought that doesn't change. And then the material world is kind of a collapsed probability or almost the collapsed particle form of the wave of pure potentiality, if that makes any sense. Um, and that we are functioning as creators by holding that fixity of purpose but absolutely there have to be actions taken as well have to be actions and it's there's a really great process i might go into a little bit today about its thought feeling which is the vibration that goes out action and then result or reaction what ends up coming back and they're really kind of a reworking of the hermetic principles, which the first hermetic principle is the law of mentalism. All things are mental, that there is one mind. Um, and things come about from holding a thought in that one mind. And the next would be the, the one of um, correspondence, so as above, so below. And so what we hold in that thought, the one mind creates in the one thing. And then the law of vibration, so that as we can maintain that fixed thought, then it will bring into being the attraction towards us the, of these things. But uh, as you said, it, it requires more than just sitting around and, and um, just meditating on the one thing, a big bag of money showing up. And that's also, as we get into the other chapters, we'll see that's not in congruence with the law of increasing life for all, but we'll, we'll, we'll go there. So from a practice standpoint, how, how would you interpret it? So it's, I, I start my practice. I have a, I need to have a very set clear vision of what it is that I want. Yes. But then also the, the way when you're setting that intention, it's basically putting into forces the, those interactions. So you might meet the right person that's going to help you build your practice or something like this. It's setting those things yes. in motion, having that yes. intention. Okay. Yes. Um, and it, so it's having a very, very clear fixed, idea um and we'll get into that in further chapters about thinking and acting in a certain way with the certainty that comes with it and it's acting from a place of faith confidence and belief that you know this is going to happen um but continually making the actions that pull that reality towards you uh and so what happens is we usually get what we really 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 want you know the things that we focus on the things that we you know, like John Martini talks about our different values and you don't have to motivate, you know, a, a 12, 13 year old boy to play video games. You know, he'll get out of bed to play video games and it requires no outside motivation because he's drawn to it, you know. Um, and so basically when it's something that we actually do want and we hold that fixity of purpose, 
then we will take the actions that will move us towards that. But what happens is a lot of times, like we talked about last time, the kind of culture, mother, father, teacher, preacher, and the, the values and attitudes of others being injected into us, we think we have to have the goals that other people have. And then we don't hold that fixed purpose because it's not what we really desire and what we really want. And we don't make the actions and do the things which draw us towards that because we can't hold the fixed thought because we don't really, that's not what we give a shit about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think the, that applies to how we as chiropractors now with the way the, the chiropractic's taught in the schools that we kind of limit ourselves to what chiropractic is capable of doing. Whereas back in the day, like the way it's, the, it's said in the book, the person's power to cause formation comes from the things that he thinks about. So these guys back in the day that were seeing cancers here a lot and blind eyes were seeing, they really believed in what they were doing and they weren't really putting limitations on themselves. Whereas today, we've kind of put this MSK like limitations all oh, we're not able to do that mm -hmm. because science hasn't been able to prove that we're doing that. And to, to be able to adjust and see miracles, you need to be able to believe that that can happen. You know, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's, it's the opposite of the placebo. It's the nocebo. So when you start to hold the fixed image and think in a certain way from a place of doubt, like that couldn't happen. That won't happen. That's ridiculous. Um, there's no evidence for that. Uh, you know, I don't have, I haven't seen a randomized clinical control trial on that. Then that's fine. You're, you're creating, you're a very powerful creator. So you will draw that reality towards you. Mm -hmm. And what's great about the science of getting rich is when you, he says it's a science, but the first step is believing that there is a, a thinking substance in which all form is produced. And, uh, people being thinking centers can put their thought on that and create as as a creator but if your fundamental premise is like that's bullshit i don't believe that and it's all a random collection of atoms and molecules and uh you're a physical materialist and a militant atheist that there's nothing beyond the physical then yeah it's highly unlikely you're going to be seeing crazy miracles from chiropractic the a sentence that made me think about the evidence-based crowd that are just sticking to this it said to think according to appearance is easy to think truth regardless of appearance is laborious so in other words these guys and you said in the past that you struggled with this whenever you were in school as well as they need the randomized controlled trial because to trust that the, the body is very intelligent and is capable of all these things to them that would take a lot of labor it takes a lot of mental ram to be able to do that mm -hmm. yeah because there's, um, it's basically, actually, I do want to, I kind of want to draw out this drawing. I think it'll be helpful. Um, I'm going to throw this, this screen on real quick and I will add in a video that people can watch as well about Thurman Fleet, uh, his stick man concept. And he really, uh, he came up with concept therapy, but it's very congruent with the hermetic principles with the science of getting rich with this new thought. He was very, uh, very, very well read in DD's uh, work. And um, I, think it's, I think it's important. So basically, he talks about there's the mind. Um, okay. And the body. Okay. And these. So obviously, you see the mind is bigger than the body. And there's two parts of the mind. There's above. Okay. So above this line is what we refer to as our conscious mind. So this conscious subconscious okay um when we're first born we don't have a lot of mental faculties we don't have a conscious mind we're pretty much just subconscious and so up here you're going to have the five senses right so you got seeing hearing smelling tasting blah 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 and they're like antennas that pick up from the external world and so we pick up via vibration into there and it's implanted into our subconscious mind. And what's in our subconscious mind, so all of our beliefs, our attitudes, um, even genetics is really nothing but the, the metabolic end product of all the experiences of our ancestors. That's it, it's just things that, it's sensory experiences that they had that are stored. So anyway, this is implanted here and what's in the subconscious becomes manifest in the body and the environment. 
okay? And so what's so difficult is until we're 70 years old, we just have that stuff kind of hardwired in the subconscious. It's like you have no conscious mind. And so we take on the beliefs, we take on the thoughts of others, and we take on what we see and the vibrations around us, okay? But then once we are able to reason and have willpower, there's something different. So on the inside of the conscious mind, that's where you have intuition, imagination, you have um, perception, you have rationality, you have um, just basically imagine it inside versus outside. And so what is very difficult is all this stuff that's out here in the environment. The hardest work that uh, Wallace Waddle says is that it's basically it's far harder to maintain focus on your inner image in here in the conscious it's far harder to do that work and maintain it there when everything that you're seeing out here in the environment looks different and everything the way it, you if you're focusing on what you see out here in the environment then you're taking that in and you're thinking it and you're making that pattern stronger and it tends to um be kind of self-perpetuating does that make sense okay yeah so the idea of being he talks about the hardest work you know people think oh you just yeah just focus on what you want and big bags of money will show up like it's super easy okay it's very simple but it's not easy to hold fast to something inside that's hold that image larger than what you're seeing in your present reality and so that whole thing about uh seeing is believing or believing is seeing you know, it's very hard for people that need the tangible evidence that it's this really skeptical mindset. It's very, very hard for them to act with any level of faith that something they haven't seen or don't have yet is going to come into fruition. And where, when did that shift happen for you? Because you were one of those people that you, you needed it to be, you needed yeah. the randomized controlled trials to justify what it was you were learning. Um. I think it was reading, um, I don't know if there's Reggie Gold or Joe Strauss, but it's basically, I, I had a background in biochemistry and I just remember all the reactions and I remember kind of freaking out and having all this anxiety that um, I'm not going to be able to learn all these pathways before I die. And then there was something, there was a moment where I just realized like, oh, wow, as complicated as this is, it's not like some dude sat around and wrote this up. You know, this is like the mind of the universe. This is, there's the universal intelligence that's holding this together. I don't have to have it all figured out. I have to trust it, that there's something larger and bigger than me. And it was, uh, it was a huge revolutionary moment for me because I was pretty much just atheist, you know, and just kind of structural materialist. And um, yeah, it was a really, really powerful feeling. It, gave, it got rid of the panic and anxiety. Because it just, it just struck me as, I think it might have been Reggie Gold saying something to the effect of, um, you know, say you're a, um, a bushman in the Kalahari Desert in Africa and you stumble across a, a watch and you see the watch and you're like, you don't know what it is. You don't really know that it's for telling time. You might figure out it's for telling time, but you don't think for a second that it randomly rolled down the mountain and just came together in this organized form. You know, that there was some level of, design or organizer things that are organized need an organizer okay so that that for me was i think what what shifted was realizing that there had to be an intelligence and then later it just started reading things like like this and um the hermetic principles the Kabbalion, and the, um, a lot of the stuff um spinsky uh, guru jeff um just a lot of different authors people have been arguing about this for millennia and then when you follow it all the way back it goes back to the mystery schools and basically from egypt and the forerunner to to greece and in those areas so yeah they've been arguing about it for a long long time but i put it in the in the action and it seemed to work so Kyle Parker, we're, we're hold, not arguing over anything new no 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 no, this has been going on for so long. And then I started to realize, um, I mean, it's all around our personal values. And I didn't want to feel stupid, you know, like I didn't, like it's really important to me. And that comes from, you know, my dad, when, when I was younger, he, 
he thought a lot of people were stupid and the worst thing I could be was be like dumb. And, uh, you know, our voids drive our values. So things that we're missing in life, we tend to value a lot and we go after that. And um, then just something coming to realization, like you can't know it all. You're not going to know it all. It's like, you're not, um, it's, it's crippling to live in that just headspace of like, I got to have it all figured out. It's absolutely crippling. So it just gave me more freedom and more joy and more just, yeah, better quality of life. And, and it's actually still pretty much of a science because it's repeatable, predictable. You do it, it shows up. Yeah. But the hardest work is, you know, holding to that inner vision bigger than the outside um, reality of what you see. That's the challenge. That's the difficulty. That's awesome. Even if we wrapped it up there, that's a ton of value. That's enough value just to give out to people and they'll be happy enough that they listened in just from that. Well, that one, I think, you know, that's, that's the most important chapter to start with. And, um, cause we have to wrap our heads around that and people will have a lot of trouble. Um, you know, if we come from a real educated intelligence kind of place and, and we've got to have it figured out and ego and things like that, it's, it's, it, this won't work for you if we don't have that thing resolved okay and it might not be for everyone and it's just the whole thing i believe actually no i just freaking remembered where it came from i think it came from anthony robbins reading about how you're kind of creating your reality and not like you're god and everything that happens in your world is because you create it but that you had two ways to live life and one was as a victim things happen to you or as a captain of your own ship, as a, as a creator, things happen for you and you have the ability to affect the outcome. And I think that was, I never knew that as a kid. And I, I think I was like 18 when I read that. And I, that's, that's the first place that came from. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, the point being, go ahead. Well, for, for chapters five and six, a big point. So that whole thing about trusting the process the that there's a higher intelligence that was the big one from like chapter four for chapter five one thing that i got from it was a lot of talk about sustainability and this is almost the premise behind investing so i liked when it said you, you do not want to get rich in order to live swinishly for the gratification of animal desires this is not having a life and then it basically talks about investing but in a, in a more roundabout way and what i took from that is that the purpose of being rich is to be more productive, bring in uh, more value, add more value to other people's lives. And in order to do that, you need to invest because investing is what makes it sustainable. So if you're planting seeds and then you get the crop, you need to then plant more seeds from the crop. Now, what would the opposite of that be? Well, that is like, I mean, if, if somehow a thousand euros came into my life now, the sensible thing to do with that would be like, okay, I'm going to invest this in my health. So I'm going to buy supplements or I'm going to invest this into my adjusting somehow. I'm going to go to some seminars. Then that means that although I don't get the instant gratification right now, it means that in the future I'll be better at adjusting whenever I go out and I start practicing the money, the money comes back. Right. Or you could look at it another one and be like, okay, there's a thousand euros here. If I go out and I buy a, a thousand euros worth of drugs and alcohol, I can probably have a really fun weekend, right? I'm going to have a really mm -hmm. fun weekend. But then the, the opportunity cost from the hangover is going to set in and now you've lost the money and that's never coming back. It's gone. So right. even like right from the start, hundreds of years ago, he's basically saying like, have a bit more stoicism and, and, and don't be so tight with the money, but you do need to invest some of it back if you want to reap the rewards. Yeah, Absolutely. And I would even go so far as to say that um, that just shows you what your real values are. Because when we act in that certain way and we do the things that we actually care about, so like it's very obvious that you care about chiropractic and becoming a better adjuster. So as you put the energy and effort, your money will come in and you'll put it out towards that. And it'll keep coming out and going that way. And then you get good at it. And all of a sudden you're doing it very well and it starts to come back to you. But I'll play devil's advocate. Say you went out and spent a thousand bucks on drugs and, and booze and, uh, you know, like you're going out. Maybe your biggest thing is, is social and connecting with people. And maybe 
you do that every time money comes in you go out towards that and then maybe at some point after a period of 10 years or whatever you build this club and like that's really what you're there to create you know like if you really value the social then that's where the money will go and maybe if social is one of your highest values maybe you become an event planner maybe you become a club owner maybe you become whatever but in a way as long as you're doing it in a way that brings greater life to others it'll attract other people with those values does, does that make sense yeah, yeah so, makes sense. so so the point being is if you're just going like all i care about is money and all i want to do is accumulate money then it stops up the the energetic flow it stops up the um the machinery of creation but if you're going after what you genuinely, genuinely care about, and I suggest everybody do the Demartini values process, I'll add that at the, the end of this, um, but know what's important to you because that's not only what's going to give you what you want, it's going to bring you towards being able to give your gifts, okay? Because the other part in increasing life is that it's not just about getting more, it's about giving more use value than you get in cash value. It's about advancing life for all. And so what that really is, it's like, you know, altruism and selfishness, he says in there, have to be balanced. So there's that concept of, of fair exchange, but you're, um, you're giving to the world and the money comes back as a result of that. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, you're providing service, you're providing value and should be compensated as a result. So if I've spent all that money and time and energy on going to seminars to become a really good adjuster, of course, when I graduate, I'm entitled to that coming back because I'm giving that value and it's going to come back. I'm going to receive more than I invested in the first place. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You'll, you'll receive more um, because you're, you're investing in your future, but you're also giving more and you're, you're, putting, you're holding it as a fixed concept in your mind. So of course it's going to come towards you. That doesn't mean for a second that you're not putting in effort. It doesn't mean that you're not out there, you're training, you're doing the work, you're going to seminars, but it's the idea of holding the fixed concept of I want to be an amazing adjuster and I want to be a great chiropractor and I want to have a busy practice and I want to help a lot of people. Holding that fixed concept, which gives you the capacity to do the work. Yeah. And you know what I mean? That, it, it reminded me of uh, whenever I was personal training, I remember I, I hired a consultant and he would give like advice on your personal training business. And it was 80 pounds for an hour. And I think I bought a block of 10. So over the space of six months, I had 10 sessions with this guy. And when my mom, we were talking about our parents last time and your parents values with money. When my mom heard that I had spent that money, she went insane. She was like, oh my God, how, how can you spend that? Like, this guy's just going to talk to you on the phone and you spent this much money. And I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm going to make more money from the advice that he's given me. And I made the money back many, many times over from the stuff that he was oh, yeah. telling me that was going wrong in the business. So it was an investment. And I was, I was a young guy, early twenties at the time. And I was like, mom, the, the people my age, they're spending that 80 euros an hour. They might go and spend that in the bar. I'm putting it into something that's going to make me money back on the other end. So it's the same kind of concept. Totally. Absolutely. I, I remember the first time that I dropped, um, it was uh, $3,000 on a coaching, um, like a practice systems thing. And I didn't have the money. You know, I put it on a card and I just, God, you know, my mom was like, what are you doing? Spending that kind of money. And I, it was Eric Plasker's, um, practice library and I remember I got like one thing out of it that just changed everything and it was just this sentence you know you're doing a history with somebody and they're telling you what's going on with them and it's okay that's great thanks for sharing that let me tell you what we do and how we go about it and it was just this transition phrase to like here's your brain here's your body and I, I mean nobody taught me how to do like an ROF or how to do you know day one or anything like that and it just gave me a little bit of organization that three grand made me hundreds of thousands of dollars you know it was uh yeah yeah absolutely yeah i, I understand I, where you're coming from i remember just as a side tangent there was there was one night I, I was with you patrick and i had just thrown down a load of money onto a seminar and i was still i was i had like you know the buyer's remorse so i had buyer's remorse after it, and you told me you were like there's going to be some stuff where you'll spend a lot of money on it and you'll get one or two things and whatever maybe it wasn't worth the money 
there's going to be other stuff you invest in. Maybe, maybe you didn't even spend that much money on it and it's going to yeah. get you. And there, there's no way to know. There's no way to know what's going to resonate with you and what's going to be a, of, of use further down the line. But because you're putting it out there, it will come back and just trust that it's going to come back. hundred yeah. percent. I would say I probably spend, well, depending on the year, but on average, probably 30 grand or more a year on, on training things to, make me better as a chiropractor as a person or because it's um yeah things to advance life in me so i can help advance life in others and then it just it always comes back exponentially so awesome yeah and uh as as a final point to touch on uh i really like the quote it was remember if you are to become rich in a scientific and certain way you must rise entirely out of competitive thought which touches on what we spoke about on the last session you must never think for a moment that the supply is limited. And it got me thinking about uh, money. So if people are in poverty, it's not, okay, there's a finite amount of money and we just didn't get uh, enough, so we have to live within our means. Uh, patience, there's enough patience out there that even if you only saw the ones that you completely wanted to see and were excited to come and see you, there would still be far too many for you to see in the day. And also um, <laughs> relationships. You know, when, whenever people are going out, like if, if I go out to a, a club and I talk to, a, let's say I step up to a girl and I want to go and ask a girl out, if you get rejected, well, it's not that she rejected you. She just, she didn't get enough time like to, to get to know that person because she hasn't got enough time in her day. But the next person, you might be the complete archetype, the, uh, the sim that, that she is looking for. So the, the, there's an abundance of relationships out there. There's abundance of patience for you and there's an abundance of money to be made. So maybe you get rejected by that, that, uh, the person of the opposite sex that you're looking for or that patient, but you just didn't happen to be what that patient is looking for. The next one might be completely in love with you. Yeah. And on that same token, you know, that is another human being with their own values and desires and things like that. And when it's, when you go into it in a competitive plane, like it's a zero sum game and I've got to get something as opposed to like, this is who I am and I'm here to uh, mutually be in a mutually beneficial thing and give as well as get, then maybe that's not the person that wants to, to give to you. But it, you can meet with someone else where it's like, it's actually two human beings that actually have something more where two plus two is five instead of uh, another person to get a thing from if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the rising out of the create the competitive plane is huge. Rochelle and I went for a run today and I was just talking like, it's probably going to, there's going to be some big economic consequences, but just so grateful that we have our hands. I've got a astrolite and I mean, if I had to do a box on the wall for coconuts or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's an abundant universe You take care of people. You can't, out give the giver you know like you can't give more life to people and not be taken care of it's impossible yeah and there'd be such a state of confidence that comes from that where it's like if you lost all your money tomorrow as long as you have the two hands that innate gave you and an astrolite you're you're not going to go hungry you know there's a there's a exactly. there's a quiet confidence that comes from that and 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 the reason the only reason that that will work is you have to come from that um, not competitive plane, but the creative plane and know that what you're giving is of more use value than cash value. I'm not going to the club and I'm just trying to get laid to get a number, you know, for my self-confidence. I'm not going to the office to try and close somebody into a care plan. So I get X number of visits and X amount of this. It's not, it's not a getting mentality. It's a giving mentality, but there's a reciprocity that's attached to it. So that's that whole thing about use value and cash value. You have to give more than you get. And as long as you do that, it, you'll continue to get more because people will feel that exchange and you're giving something to them and they'll want to come and give more. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental law of the universe. Awesome. So read The Science of Getting Rich. You're going to get better results in your practice and you're going to get laid more. That's it. All right. <laughs> Patrick, any closing thoughts? I think that's, that was pretty good. That was a good session. Yeah, I think it's great. I'm really looking forward to the next bit because the very next chapter is about how it, we connect 
with that. And it's, it's all about gratitude. So uh, looking forward to that and we'll speak soon. All right. Thanks, man.